to it. Um, so welcome. This is week three of the Planting Our Seeds in Relationship with Grandmother's Voice program. Thank you so much for all of you who are here. Uh, if you're here for the first time, welcome. If you're coming back, welcome back. Uh, my name is Daniel. I assist the town in facilitation of some of our um, free virtual programs and uh, yeah, happy to assist in moderating today's discussion. I will turn things over to my partner, Tanya, to lead us in uh, today's um, land acknowledgement. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tanya Dorisio. I am the supervisor of culture programs with the town of Oakville. I'm also a first generation born Canadian of Italian and Austrian descent. My family came to Canada, to Oakville, in the 1950s. And I'll share with you a memory that came to me today when I was walking in the trails near my home. So like many of us since COVID, um, I've been trying to take daily walks and I'm really fortunate to live near a beautiful ravine in my neighborhood. It has these wonderful trails and I enjoy these walks and I reflect on them and I see the daily changes that happen in this forested area. And I often think about how this land was used before me, who was here before me, and also what I'll be leaving for generations after me. And so today I recalled a memory that I had about 20 years ago. So since I still have relations with family in Europe, because uh, I travel often to visit, on one of these visits, my friend asked me about Canada and about its culture. And she specifically wanted to know about its first peoples. And I remember I had difficulty answering her question because I didn't know. I didn't have resources. I just, I didn't know. And so since that time, I've been very open to learn about the Indigenous history and culture from the place where I live. And I'm grateful for all the friends that I've met, um, that I've made along this journey, and for the many programs that I'm able to participate in. And I'm grateful for this program that we're here for today to engage in with Sherry and Jody. So now when I have that conversation again with my friend in Italy, I can say that I live in Oakville and that the town of Oakville resides on the treaty lands and the territory of the Mississaugas, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. And that this land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around our Great Lakes. So I acknowledge the presence and the deep traditional knowledge, laws and philosophies of the indigenous people from whom I'm learning from and that we're sharing with on this land today. So welcome everyone. And I look forward to this evening's discussions. Thank you so much, Tanya. So next, I just want to briefly go over um, small tips for engaging in Zoom. I'm sure many of you have had to do it over the, the past months, but you're here now. We've enabled the chat box for you to communicate. I um, certainly encourage you to put your questions into the chat box, and, and I will do my best to prompt Sherry and Jody with questions where, they are, uh, where they're appropriate. Um, there's also a hands up feature if you want to submit a question verbally, um, and that's just located in your reactions at the bottom of the screen. You're also welcome to private message myself if you're having technical challenges or perhaps you have an inquiry that you don't want made public. Otherwise, we ask that everyone just keep themselves on mute so there's not too much competing background noise. Um, as you know, and you're probably looking at the participants' numbers rise, there are many people who are accessing this program and it's uh, limitless access. This is a free public virtual program which we do not require. Um, yeah, really any restriction to, we want everyone to participate. So in saying so, we, we, we just ask that everyone respect one another and each other's perspectives. Uh, and know that this program is recorded. Uh, so if you do decide to speak and your camera is on, uh, your image may be recorded. And we do so, so we can enjoy this program at a later date. And for many of whom who are not able to join us, because we all have very busy schedules, I'm sure. Finally, uh, we have some agreements in this program. So certainly we ask that everyone stay engaged throughout the, the length of the program, be it eight weeks or just this evening. If you're gonna be here, truly be here, bring your intention to us um, because that's, that's indeed why you signed up. Uh, uh, be prepared to experience some discomfort. Uh, even before we opened up the room, uh, I was mentioning to Jody and Sherry that I saw them in the Toronto Star um, for some of the work they've been doing around um, 
murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. And uh, Sherry asks, was it good? And I'm like, that's pretty uncomfortable because it's such a terrible topic that I want to, you know, it was just uncomfortable. And that often happens when we're discussing really challenging issues. Uh, so be prepared to experience some discomfort. Speak your truth. Um, of course, you're all here and you all have valuable perspectives. Feel comfortable to share them and uh, we will support you in a loving manner for sure. And then accept and expect non-closure. Um, nothing we do today will solve uh, some of the many challenges that we have and some of the inquiries and curiosities that have brought us to this meeting. Uh, and that just has to be okay. And we've asked Jody and Sherry to join us here to provide their expertise. But they certainly don't have all the answers that we're looking for. And, and we'll, we just allow that and acknowledge that. Um, that's all for me, guys. Everyone has signed up today to listen um, to our very capable instructors, and I'm just going to add the spotlights to them. Uh, this is uh, Jody and Sherry of Grandmother's Voice, and I'll hand it over to you guys. Mm, yeah, well, for those beautiful words, both of you. I'm so excited when I when I come here on Thursdays. Not that I'm rushed, not rushed getting here. <laughs> A little disheveled sometimes. But then I, I come here and I know that, that what we're doing is really beautiful and it's very important. And I'm, I'm feeling very emotional today, um, just being able to welcome everyone to this space, the third, the third evening together. And I feel like it's just so, it's so deep in my spirit and my soul. It's like, I know that I've been here before doing this work. Um, but building these relationships is really what's what this is about. This is a really strong um, relationship that we're building here. And I just want to express gratitude to uh, our friends and relatives at uh, the town of Oakville and all of you for joining us. And as we've shared the last uh, two evenings, it's very important for us to, to bring our minds and our hearts together uh, as we have these conversations and come together in our circle and what we can call that now our sacred circle because we've we've come and our circle is getting bigger and what's so wonderful is that i just have to just express the gratitude and the love that sherry and i have been feeling in the support for the work that we're doing the messages that you're sharing um you know just your comments and any anything that you're offering for to help us do this good work has been so reassuring to us that we are doing what we're what we're supposed to be doing right now. And so I'd, I'd like to acknowledge all of you, all of the people who come, all of our relatives, our cousins that are coming here. Um, so thank you, uh, Niyawa, for, for showing up. Um, I have to acknowledge our Earth Mother. I was with her today working. Uh, it's not even working. For those of you who love gardening, I haven't gardened. You know, I, 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 I created my one garden several years ago on, a, on my healing journey, and it was so surreal to me um what i what i was able to do but i it gave me that understanding of why the connection to land is so important the minute we put our hands in the the ground that just to know that we um can plant and create and grow something that can sustain us is is wonderful so acknowledging the earth mother and the waters that <laughs> our space is not quite uh prepared for us. So we didn't have a hose. Uh, so we've been, I've been bringing water to our garden and I'm, the waters are flowing for me right now because I was so grateful that even though I worked so hard to bring that water back and forth to the strawberries and the sage, and I was understanding and I was really feeling the purpose of what we're doing in Milton. And I, I really, I'm so excited that this is happening for us and in this time and you're all invited. You're all invited to come whenever, uh, whenever we can, You, the doors are open and, and we're so, we, it's surreal. But to just acknowledge the, the fish that clean our waters and the plants and the food plants and the medicine plants and the herbs and the animals, the trees, the birds, the four winds um, that continue to clean our air and and bring in all of the newness um, that we require to do what we need to do. The thunderers that shake shake the lands and you know wake us up a little bit and 
to put us into those places that, that um, Daniel was saying, the discomfort. And I had an elder today, um, an amazing man, and I, I hope that you join us after, right after this meeting on our platform, Grandmother's Voice. Dennis Windigo has been with us for three days, and he speaks about trauma and crisis. And, and this evening, he'll be speaking about, um, speaking about forgiveness. And it's, it's so beautiful to have him in our community. Um, but what he reminded me of today was that we need, we need to know that, you know, to be uncomfortable is our power. And that the discomfort that we feel is actually the power that we need to, we need to really move into and, and engage and accept and know that that discomfort really represents our power. And so how you look at that power is where your, re your reflection and, you know, what you need to work on is in that moment. And so I'd like to offer those words from him today. And then the sun, I don't know if you can tell, I have a little bit of a sunburn on my cheeks and I'm okay with that today, or it could be windburn. Um, Grandmother Moon, uh, she just was, uh, we were just in her um, changing of the moons the other day with the new moon. And so with the new moon always brings new, you know, our opportunity to wish and, and ask for, you know, the, the, the things that we know will serve our lives. Uh, the stars, which I'm just feeling so grateful right now in this moment. I can't wait to see them as, as they appear this evening. The enlightened teachers, which have been guiding Sherry and I along this journey together. And I'm so grateful that, um, she is here with me. Uh, I don't know that there's anybody else that we should be doing this with. And of course the creator. And so Nyawa for allowing me that space to acknowledge all of the natural energies that sustain us and support us on this journey together. And I'm, I'm very excited to see everyone this evening. Yes, thanks for opening up, us, us up in a good way, Jody, and, and really reminding us of all the great things that is here, uh, and especially the Mother, Mother Earth, and, and the Sun, and everything that sustains us. And thank you for those wise words as well. You can tell that the enlightened teachers are enlightening you as well. <laughs> um, I just want to recap of what, uh, what we've done in the last two weeks. We did spend some time on the Thanksgiving address and Jody just finished doing a little bit of it as well. And the importance of starting us off in a good way because it really makes us humble uh, and, and puts us in that space and place. We spoke about what the LAD acknowledgement is and why it's important. And we also showed, showed you two videos of best practices, but also one that was a satirical video from that comedy sketch, Baroness Von sketch. Last week, we spoke to, spoke to you um, some comments that we received and suggestions on where to get more information. We, we were asked, uh, oh, you know, can you give, more, give us more information? But most importantly, we talked to you. We spoke to the hesitancy of Indigenous people identifying who they were because of past injustices. However, by creating space on this platform, other Indigenous folks have identified as well because they probably felt safe to do so. We also mentioned the space that we have in Milton for our healing and medicine garden to honor missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and two-spirited individuals. And we spoke of our partnership with Minikan, who will be planting the healing garden and wellness garden, as well as Ojibacon, who will assist us with land-based programming. And we spoke about our two acres that we've also are able to bring you in and our community in. And we're so grateful, like Jody said, everybody is invited and we can hardly wait to have, have you with us in our community. But I would like to expand a little bit more uh, when we mention, I just wanna talk a little bit more about, uh, about Indigenous people. Um, and that half of Indigenous people in Canada live in urban areas. We were told as well that over 400,000 Indigenous folk live from, live from Toronto to London on the 401 corridor. And, uh, and also that the migration of Indigenous people is unique because of policies that Canada has placed upon a number of Indigenous First Nations, Métis and Inuit people living in the, in the urban areas. We, didn't ha we haven't spoke about the Indian Act, but we will be speaking about the Indian Act because the Indian Act discriminated against First Nations women 
who lost their status and were, ab were unable to pass it on to their children. That's what happened to my mom um, and, and my family. And if they, because she married a non-status non person, she married somebody that wasn't uh, indigenous. And when they lost their status, they had no choice but to move into an urban area. And these are things that a lot of people don't, don't realize. But we haven't even spoke about the Inuit. Uh, and I just wanna just really briefly talk about, uh, about the Inuit for just a minute, because I know we have a, a full a jam-packed agenda. But the, all, but the Inuit also ended up in Southern Canada in hamlets and in territories due to the federal government policies. And in the 50s and 60s, the federal government sent uh, Inuit who had tuberculosis to Southern, to the South for medical treatments. And most of you probably don't even know that there is a tuberculosis, there was a tuberculosis institution in Hamilton that housed an awful lot of Inuit that came from the North. And so they and say so they made their home there and they and they went back, but after years and years of being in a hospital. There was also many who died far away from their home and some Inuit had to recover recovered in the hospital and but remained in the south. We also know that the Inuit and the federal government and RCMP had also killed their dogs their sled dogs to force them into urban areas. And that is something that is just uh, un unthinkable, right? That we don't even know those, those things that are happening. Inuit also had to wear uh, a little tag on their, on their shirt um, that, that they didn't even know what their name was. And their name might've been Jack E2000S, right? And that was the name and the, the disc that Inuit had to have when they were traveling. When we talk about, uh, you know, we know an awful lot about the, we have, we'll talk a little bit more about the Métis in, in, a, in, a neck, in a couple of more sessions, but we also want to talk to you a little bit about the Métis script. And, you know, Métis people were given land and a lot of the land that they were given was swindled out of their hands before they could even, before they could even get on the land. And uh, so we so we wanted to talk a little bit more about that. But in the meantime, you know, I know that we have a, a fairly large, um, you know, we always have so much to say, and it's only an we only have an hour. But we really wanted to talk to you about what we're going to be talking to you today is, uh, you know, is talking about the your role, perhaps on understanding the truth and reconciliation and the calls to action. And even possibly how you can, uh, how where your calls to action is, and I think we we may have, but we can put it in the chat for where you can read the calls to action. There's 94 calls to action, and where do you fit in? And we'll have, uh, and 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 we'll talk a little bit more about the truth and reconciliation. And I think I'll change it, turn it over to you, Jody, because you've got uh, some other things that you want to talk about with the truth and reconciliation, and also the video that we may uh, may have that uh, Daniel may be able to play for us. Mm hmm. Um, when I well, I was just navigating and hosting a little bit, trying to find a, a special guest that we are bringing on. Um, what I'd like to really just talk about is. Um, the, our elders, just just to kind of hopefully segue to where we're going. Um, when Sherry and I connected in our community, and and I was explaining to her my journey, uh, you know, to find my culture, my family, my community, and that I really there was no nothing in in Halton really that was that would support that. There was education happening. Um, Sherry was was leading that uh, from when I started to really kind of see like why is there why is there no real presence in Halton, you know the names are here my 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 uh, Iroquois Ridge I understood all of that the Grand I I, I live there I understood it all, but when I was um, when I asked my cousin grandmother Renee Thomas Hill I I'd done my my healing journey and I met her, and I said to her there's no culture here can you know, are you able to come to my home? Are you able to come to my community? And she said, yes. And so one thing that I've noticed about the elders that we, we've come to know really very close now is that they don't, they, didn't, they do not use the word no. 
they do not use any words in a negative way. There's not one, I've never heard a negative word come out of their mouth. And, you know, the language I'm not, you know, I'm not, um, I don't really know too much in this, in this realm, but one of my, our elders that we, we just got to know, and I don't know that he'll like us to call him an elder because we do call him uncle. And he is probably one of the most amazing men I've ever met in my life. And Sherry, I know you can agree. Like we've, we were introduced to him. And if you, if you would like to uh, visit with him on our YouTube channel, he, he just gave us seven visits, hour long visits on our platform, talking about the history of, you know, the nation that we live in that we call Canada. And, you know, I, I am just so honored that he is like Renee and the other elders that we've asked to come in our community to guide us because we didn't know our culture. We didn't know the connection. We we were only, you know, we were doing this because we knew that we had that same drive, which we realized was our ancestors. And, and then these, you know, relatives have just moved in and just said, we're here, we're here. And these are people and I'm so honored to introduce them after we, we show a little blurb, because I, if you if you did read or watch any of the videos that Daniel shared yesterday, uh, that Michael Dockstater is who we've brought this evening because he's just, we just love him so much. Um, and he, uh, anyway, he just has is given us strength. And when he showed up in our, in our space, and yes, I'm, I just spoke with him yesterday about crying. And he said, you'll cry when the time is right to cry. And I'm crying because I'm so grateful that he is supporting us. And when he showed up, he said, I'm here for you. What do you need from me? I'm, I will do whatever you need me to do, Jody. I'm here for you. I'm here for grandma. I'm here for Sherry. I'm here for the women. I'm here to teach. I'm here. I'm here for all of you. And so I'm, I'm just so honored. Um, I have, you know, a, a list of his accolades in front of me is, you know, PhD from Cornell University, and he's an associate professor right now of Indigenous creative practice at Ryerson University. And he's got all of these amazing uh, accolades and things that he's done. And I, I'd love to share this uh, with you, but I don't want to take up any more time um, introducing him. So Daniel, if you don't mind, would you, uh, I, and I'll share this with you, I, I think we'll send it maybe in an attachment. Daniel next week or with your next one. Oh, well, there you go. And we can watch this together. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a response to Indian education, both on reserve day schools and Indian residential schools. And the idea of uh, uh, Indian education uh, as part of the government's policy was to teach Indian children obedience to authority. That was the duty and responsibility of teachers in the Indian Affairs manuals. And that caused great harm, according to the Prime Minister, uh, two of them in a row, uh, uh, Stephen Harper and Justin Trudeau, who challenged Canadians uh, to partner with Native people to remedy problems created by the education policy of the federal government. The remedy is then to partner with Canadians to uh, remedy the social, economic, political, environmental, and medical barriers to a quality of life facing Indigenous people by government policy. We hope that, that you watched. Hi. <laughs> yes, I love him. Welcome, Uncle Mike. You know, we didn't show the whole video. I hope that that most of you had the opportunity to watch that. Um, Sherry did, before you arrived, just briefly talked about uh, the TRC. And, and, and I think Daniel um, put some in the chat as well. But we really brought, like, Mike talks about, when he's with us, he talks about real life, like stuff that's happening now. Right? You want to know about the history? We'll talk about the history. What do you want to know? I'll tell you. 
And, but today, and in, in, in the last conversation, you know, every once in a while, when we're finished our conversations, I'll say, Hey, what do you think? It, like, what is this about? And then he's got this, you know, plethora of knowledge that I, I lose track of. But he said to me today, yesterday, he's like, well, what do you want me to come and talk about? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I we just shared the video and, you know, let's just have a conversation. Tell us what you know in 20 minutes. <laughs> so welcome, Uncle Mike. Merci for coming, for being yes, here. Hello, welcome. What do you want to know? <laughs> Well, that was the thing we did say, um, if there's anyone that has a direct question, if you did watch the video uh, that we sent yesterday or Daryl, Daniel sent, you know, please ask Uncle Mike. Uh, he said that he'd love to answer any of the conversations. Um, but, you know, you and I had a conversation and we were a brief, very, very little one. And I love when every once in a while I get this message in Facebook or wherever, like just, you know, some information that's in the in the media. Right. So I, I always like to say, let's talk about the stuff happening right now, because if we really think we're going to get together and talk about the history, that doesn't make sense to me. So I'm, all, I'm always about action. And mm -hmm. so I and I always like to think, talk about talk about the realities and the important stuff. And I think that there's a lot of miss. What's the word? I'm not I don't know the word misconceptions. Maybe is that the word misinformation? about Indigenous people in Canada and our government and our, Judy, all of that stuff. Jody, there are questions coming in the chat if you'd like. I can, um, if maybe, because there, there are nearly 100 folks here. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the first ones come through is from Jason. Um, and and I, I think this is for, for uh, Dr. Doc Stater, but I'm sure anyone can answer. Do you, do you think Bill C-15 is a step forward or is this something that needs to be redone before consideration? Bill C-15 is actually a restatement of the Indian Advancement Act of 1864, where the Crown pledged to fully assimilate, integrate, and extinguish Native people into Canadian society. In 1864, the Indian Advancement Act was uh, the policy that became later on called the Indian Act in Canada. And the Indian Act in 1925 was revised to uh, express the governance of the government of Canada over Indian, Indian affairs in the country. And one of the reasons why that needed to be uh, enacted in that way was because the government of Canada in the late 1800s through to 1924 had extinguished the original signatory treaty councils across the whole country. That included the Potlatch people of British Columbia, the Sundance people in the Plains and the great law people. Those were the three indigenous law systems that were in existence and governed over the treaties that were made by indigenous people with the crown. And so the termination policy to terminate that treaty relationship had by 1924 included the overthrow of the treaty signatory a coup d'etat, that's what you'd call it. It's a coup d'etat. There was a coup d'etat instigated. So from that time onward, uh, Duncan Campbell Scott, famous guy, and Arthur J. Ludington in, in 1912 got together and formulated what they call it Indian termination. They produced policies for both Canada and the United States called Indian termination that led then to in 1924, the overthrow of tribal signatories across the whole country. It just happened. By the way, I'm not going to say good or bad, no value judgments here. I'm just going to tell you what happened and then go back to, to, to answer Jason's question about what that means. So from that moment on, from 1925 on, the imp imposition then of the Indian Act system of governance had included elected band councils that were uh, uh, directly under the authority of the Minister of Indian Affairs. That's what it says in the Act in uh, Section 35. When he deems it advisable for the good governance of a band, the minister may have elected a chief and 12 councillors. That's what it says. And what are they governing over? That's uh, in the limited scope of the Indian, Affair, in the Indian Act had them catch stray dogs, 
cut noxious weeds and uh, look after the infrastructure on the in the in the in the Indian reserves across the country. And uh, that was extended after the Second World War, when soldiers in the First World War and soldiers in the Second World War began to say, uh, we went to fight for this country. And because we went to fight for this country, we believe that we have an entitlement to some rights that are accorded to us that included the Soldier Settlements Act and other things, but also the right to vote that came out in the 1950s. From there, the, the right to vote uh, included both uh, uh, the uh, uh, acceptance of, of an Indian person as enfranchised from their band to become fully Canadian, but also then the application of voting rights because they're voting for band councils. So why would that be any different in the application of law in terms of being able to participate in provincial and federal governments? So from the 1950s and 60s, then there was a movement among the Canadian crown at the provincial level and the federal level than to uh, uh, try to place Indian councils or Indian communities within the scope of federal law and provincial law that led to then a whole process for dealing with such things as discriminatory practices, uh, Bill C-31, which had the idea that Indian women who married white men lost their status and so did their children, which was wrong, but also that was part of the whole changes that came in place with the legislation. Also, there were advancements in that relationship that included taxation uh, that became part of the Indian Taxation Advisory Board. And that was linked then to education with the Indian self-government or Indian control of education. So there's a linkage there between taxation. And you know this, part of your municipal taxes go to education. Anybody that lives in municipal uh, settings knows that there's a, a, a use for taxation at a municipal level. So the process has been then from the 1970s on to try to draw Indian reserves into the municipality streams that deal with such things as the, the Ontario Municipal Board, the Municipalities Act. Also incorpora incorporation became an important function with that. And that the idea then was that the uh, schools, healthcare, infrastructure on Indian reserves was linked then to uh, finances. And uh, by the 80s, uh, there became a whole move towards Indian economic development, which then had a realization that Native people were fully participa participating in the Canadian economy and had an economic impact. And that e economic impact actually came through the arts, through tourism where people went to places to go and see the Indians. People came from other countries to come to Ontario to go and see the Indians. We're gonna go see Otto Agua Canyon. We're gonna to go to powwows. We're gonna go visit Indian reserves and buy uh, arts and crafts. And maybe a Norvell Moriso painting. Oh yes, we can find a Moriso and we can find a Ojik uh, in Ontario anyways. So the idea of tourism being an important economic driver that had uh, a, 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 a a platform with Indigenous people in Ontario was begun to be was begun to be realized, and out of this whole movement, then in that whole transition from 1864 with the Indian Advancement Act for the full assimilation and and integration and extinguishment of Native people to the extinguishment clauses in the termination policies of Indian Affairs in 1925, you had a whole process then of socialized. Uh, actions within the government relations between native people and the old signatories. There's still support. So uh, I'll do a demographic profile here uh, around 1990. And I'll just deal with Six Nations uh, because it generally it applies as a model to a lot of Indian, Indian reserves. Um, generally speaking, 5% of the population actually votes in the band council elections. 5% of the people actually vote in the band council elections. So you could become the chief councillor or the chief of six nations by having 250 votes out of 15,000 people. You could be elected to the council by having your relatives vote in, vote you in with 110 votes and so on. This is how, this is how democracy was implemented on the reserve 
by the overthrow of the old traditional government governance processes and the replacement of this government process with an elected band council. So let's go to the other side of it then. There is then a move by regulating native people in the traditional sphere as religions, like the Amish and the Mennonites. So you're not a political people with, who are signatory to international treaty, you're believers of contrite religions and you have ult, a holdament of ultimate truth. And we give you the right to marry and bury your own people. That happened so that there's a recognition then of what they call the Haudenosaunee or the longhouse religion as having a stature in the community. So you have 5% of the people actually vote in the election. You also have 5% of the people actually go to the longhouse and practice the longhouse religion. This is generally how it spoke. And when I did that demographic profile for the band council in uh, Around 1999, I think it was, or 2000, when Dave General was the band council chief, I did a, uh, a inventory of the demographic profile of six nations. And at that time, there were 22,000 people, I believe it was. And I said that, you know, a thousand people actually vote, a thousand people actually go to the longhouse. That means that there's an informal coalition going on between those people who go to the longhouse and the elected council to actually spend all the money that comes into the community. So who's speaking for the other 90% that don't go to Longhouse? And this was ever represented when they were talking about the uh, application of the Indian Advancement Act in these days, which had to deal with the First Nations Governance Act, First Nations Taxation Act, and the First Nations Lands Act that were proposed in around 2000 by uh, the Canadian government I think Robert Nault, uh, Robert Nault was the Indian Affairs Minister in those days. But the key feature of that was that self-government now was being interpreted in terms of the Municipal Act. So you have the right to uh, form a police. Uh, the band owns all the land and you have the right to tax. That was the key ingredients there. And if you know, that's democracy in the non-native world, eminent domain of government, police to enforce the laws, and the right to taxation that's agreed to you by when you sign your income tax, you're saying you agree to allow Canada uh, to tax you. That's why you sign an income tax form, by the way, did you know that? That you're giving up your, you're surrendering your authority to the government of Canada to tax you. That's why you sign it. Give me a break. They know what you made. They've got the T4 slips. It's all calculated. They have all your information about all of your revenue that you made last year. And then they ask you to fill out the form and sign it so that you're giving permission to them to tax you. They don't tell you this stuff, but it's stuff that we know in the Indian community because we say we question these kinds of things when government says stuff like that to us. So you have 10% of the population who are actually uh, in authority places to spend the money that comes into the reserve. Here's, here's the way it goes now. Back when we weren't making anything, back when we were poor people, transient farm, farmers, uh, construction workers, and so on, our economic impact meant that the government of Canada said, uh, well, that's all you do is your farmers and construction workers, and we've got a few teachers and nurses, but your economic impact means that we'll give you a road grader, uh, we'll give you some houses, uh, welfare houses, and uh, we'll uh, do such things as uh, run the schools and, uh, uh, and uh, you catch the stray dogs and noxious weeds, so there's the money. But over the course of the years, and people began to diversify and become professionals, the amount of money generated in the community increased. So we got more road graders, we got paved roads, we got government buildings because uh, we were generating more revenue in the economy. And that included then the idea that uh, people began to question, so what's going on here with native revenue? Uh, how come it is now that we've got all these big buildings and that? Well, because it's the economic impact. Direct taxation, indirect taxation, and economic leakage was beginning to be measured. And the Canadian uh, coalition 
in, in support of native people, Kaznip, actually wrote a, a little report on that that began to document then the expenditure in Canada. And they and that was backed up by a senior policy advisor named Russ Moses in the government of Canada, who actually pointed out that it cost various levels of government 90 cents to deliver 10 cents that actually reaches the native people. 90 cents to deliver 10 cents that actually reaches the communities. So you'll say, and I think the figure that they used in those days was uh, uh, 500 million. 500 million actually reached the reserves and reached the people out of 5 billion that was earmarked for the communities through the federal treasuries and the provincial treasuries. So what does that mean? Okay, well, here's a picture. Uh, there's little on reserve economic development. Yeah, we've got a bingo hall. Yes, we have gas stations. Yes, we've got smoke shops and so on. But in terms of there being a, an industrial or manufacturing, manufacturing now is smoke shops, right? And when you go to a reserve, you'll see that the, the, uh, it's, it's very much uh, a, a serv service industry that is based on uh, people governing over our affairs in social services, education, health services, and so on. But the actual workforce, 80% uh, of the people at Six Nations don't work there. They work off the reserve and pay income tax. And so the 20% that do work on the reserve also make a living, but there's nowhere to go to spend it. So we go to Ikea, you know, in Kitchener. We go to Zares in Brantford. We go to Walmart. We spend all of our money outside of our community. And that's what they meant by economic leakage. Direct taxation, people work off the reserve and they're taxed directly. Indirect taxation, every time I buy something, there's taxes associated with that all the way down the line. Plus, there have been agreements made between the tobacco industry with the government of Canada for excise taxes, so that you have the large tobacco industry paying millions of dollars in income tax or, or excise taxes to the government of Canada. What does that mean? Well, here's the ratio of them. 90 cents to deliver 10 cents. Currently at Six Nations, $70 million is sent to run infrastructure, services, policing, and so on. But also the calculation is for direct taxation, indirect ta taxation, and economic leakage, $700 million leaves the 27,000 people who are members of the Six Nations and goes to Ottawa and Toronto. So the ratio still exists. And that means then uh, coming back to truth and reconciliation, what does that mean? Well, there is a, a, and I used to work for those guys, you know, I worked for Indian Affairs and I worked in the communications branch and I designed exhibits and I did, and I got to see their documents when John Monroe was the minister and so on. And the, the spin is this, that they make an effort to convince Canadians that Native people are a burden on the Canadian taxpayer. All the stuff we get, free education, free hospitals, free all of this stuff comes out of Canadians' pockets, which is the government spin and manufacturing consent to terminate Indigenous rights. Because when you do the economics and you do the profiling of the spending and the economics dealing with the Native people, you find out this, we're paying our own way. Not a dime comes from Canadian people. It's all our own way. It's all our own money. And so the question then is, and this is where we go to the 5% that vote and 5% that are part of the longhouse, get down to Ottawa and get our 90% our back. Right? Dr. Dr. Mike, top. if if I may ask a, a a question that goes kind of on top of that, and it's similar to one that's been asked in the chat. So, if if the narrative that's being portrayed is that um, Indigenous folks are not carrying their own weight um, within the Canadian economy, um, 
So the, the question that, that I'm kind of curious about is, so how, how can we as, particularly many in this chat as non-Indigenous people, um, do a more effective job at retelling the story of Indigenous culture? Uh, you mentioned in your video about not teaching Indigenous, um, about in teaching Indigenous culture versus Indigenous artifacts. And, you know, t and especially I know in our first meeting, many folks asked about how to teach young people about Indigenous history effectively. How can we teach about Indigenous culture as non-Indigenous people in a way that is um, effective, appropriate, uh, and with respect in relation to our local Indigenous communities? I suppose take it personally, right? One of the ways to start off is to take it personally. If they can do it to us, and they are, they can do it to you, and they are. I mean, you've got people, uh, senators ro roaming around, and this has been a, a big, uh, what do you call it, a uh, um, um, a thing in Ottawa about uh, senators uh, on the uh, public purse and misappropriation of funding and all of that kind of stuff. So they've been doing that to us for 150 years. And the realization is, uh, by the way, do you know that 5% of the Canadian population controls 75% of the wealth? And that power elite, which are the rich, rich people, they have the debt, not you. Sounds radical. Like, what do you mean? Well, it's true. You know, absolutely, it's just the way it is. And there are a lot of sociology studies that will say that 5% of the Canadian population that they call the Canadian power elite, they own all the stuff control 75% of the wealth, and they leave the, re the other 25% for the rest of us to argue over, and then make the communications plan to say, you know, those Indians, boy, boy, they sure got it easy with free education and free health care, and it's coming out of your pocket. Well, when you really stop and you think about it, and I see this all, I taught at McGill, and I taught at Queens, and I taught at Laurier, and I, I've taught mostly non-native students, by the way, and I show them because as a sociologist, you show them the data and show them the slides with all the charts on it, stuff from StatsCan. And they'll go, how come they don't teach us this stuff in school? And I said, you're asking the wrong guy. Go ask the people that run your school system why you're not taught this stuff in school. I'm telling you something that you probably don't get taught in school. And the question then is why? So I know and there what, are many there are many teachers in in this group and I, I well I mean I have the privilege of seeing everyone's emails and stuff I know there are many community professionals uh, in the group as well so where in terms of teaching or those folks take taking the role of you know calls to action truth and reconciliation and putting that sort of in their tool bag of things that they're responsible for building and injecting into community um, you know where do we where do we start um, one of the things was, I, I'll, this is your government did this too, by the way, Correct. I'll tell you a story, I'll tell you a story, and uh, how you use it, I, I encourage you to. In the, in the 1980s, Brian Mulroney was the Prime Minister of Canada, and David Crombie was the Minister of Indian Affairs. So Mulroney got everybody together, and he said, look, let's get our Indian problem solved. You know, somebody run up the bill and let's pay it off and let's get it over and done with. So they got a guy, his name was Walter Rudnicki. And Walter Rudnicki was a senior policy analyst at Indian Affairs who wrote a 650 page report called the Treaty Implementation Program from Mulroney and Crombie. And he said in his report, uh, since the Royal Proclamation of 1763, resource use, land uh, tax uh, that you don't have title to, and a whole number of economic instances, the to total bill that he said was, you implement the treaties and pay off the treaty debt, then let's start from there. And, and the, the, the amount of money he identified was in 1986, $11.5 trillion from coast to coast, the treaty debt. Now, this is Walter Rudnicki a senior policy analyst for Indian Affairs who wrote a report called the Treaty Implementation Program for Brian Mulroney's government. And they were, what? Swamped. So they began to then uh, embark after that by re-polishing off the Indian Advancement Act. And they came up with the Buffalo Jump. 
And this is, you can actually Google this and find the Buffalo jump strategy of the, of the Canadian government. And it was basically this, we will sell our plan to municipalize all of the native communities to uh, our special champion band. This is what they call them, special champions, band council chiefs. And when they buy into our plan, they will run over the Buffalo jump and all the native people will follow them over the Buffalo jump. Now, I don't know if you know what a Buffalo jump is, but in the old days, and they did it with deers as well, they would create these uh, 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 barricades where they would herd Buffalo over a cliff or they would herd deer over a cliff and then they would butcher them down there. So the Buffalo jump strategy was all about selling uh, some elected band council chiefs on the Canadian government's plan to terminate native people. And as they were running along, all the native people would follow them right over the Buffalo jump, Indian termination, 1989. And they began with cutbacks to post-secondary education. That was the target in 1988. That led to hunger strikes, protests all over the country, right? That was followed by 1990, OCA. Right? That was followed by a whole number of instances of resistance where people said, no, you're not going to terminate our rights uh, because you've got a problem with the debt and you're trying to get rid of us so you can get out of the debt. So just telling those kinds of stories, and they're absolutely uh, um, uh, uh, historically factual in terms of what happened way back when. Um, let me see if I can find a reconciliate or a conciliatory point in here with what you're asking, Daniel which is what, what do we do about all of that in order to educate ourselves and our families about what we're going to do from now on? I don't know if that's yes, too ambiguous, but if you could maybe ask a direct question about what, you're, what you were thinking. Yes, sir. So I, I believe that many people in this group have joined this um join this program because they feel like they have a, a reasonable understanding of of that there has been injustice that has taken place and they believe in a uh, country that justice should have its place now looking at themselves in either their role of professional or family or even as you know canadians what ought we do and i i've gone through the 94 calls to action and it's really ask you, there's a lot that seems like it's the responsibility of the federal government. However, we the people are the arms of the federal government. So what is it that, you know, well-minded people who are, there's, you know, 95 of them here, what, what can we do practically? Um, we got real serious problems. I mean, put all the money aside and all that stuff. I could go, I, I refuse to be a victim. I refuse to be a victim. And I come back and I tell my students this, um, you know, uh, we got a problem with the water in Lake Erie. Let's all take our cups, all 95 of you, and let's go down to Lake Erie and have a drink of water right out of the lake. Would you do it? No. Is that acceptable to you? No, sir. So then what are we going to do about that? There's, there's one thing on the list. Uh, see that yellow streak in the sky from industry that goes across our horizon? that has filled with dioxin and all kinds of stuff that fills the ducks and geese and so on. Is that acceptable to you? No. no well, then what are we going to do about that? Um, we've got a problem with uh, 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 prescription drugs in the country. We have a, uh, uh, a, the war on drugs has created a whole environment for drug use in the country that is uh, creating huge issues with the whole cycle of crime and poverty in the country. Is that acceptable to you? Yes, no. Sir. What are we going to do about that? Uh, having a safe place to live for your children and my children and my grandchildren, is, and is that something that we want? Of course. Then how are we going to do that? Uh, by the way, um, we have serious problems with climate change and global warming now, where the sun is coming up and setting in a different place, the elders say, from where it had before. Uh, you've got ice caps melting in Antarctica and the Arctic releasing unknown microorganisms that have been buried on the ice under the ice for millions of years. And all of a sudden, we got strange diseases all over the place that our 
elders talked about a long time ago. Is that acceptable? Should we do something about that? Hmm. Uh, fossil fuels, uh, money. Money is a big problem. Fiat currency, paper money versus cryptocurrency now. But the real, the real currency is oil. Countries are tankering oil. That's the, country, that's the currency right now. So we've got a problem to think about how you're going to feed your own people. So what do you say to the native people? They come along and they go, uh, you ever heard of permaculture gardening and sustainable life systems? Uh, should we actually be taking, you know, those groves that are down the mediums of uh, streets and highways around in your city? Should we be turning them into orchards? Uh, should we be growing gardens with filled with uh, uh, sustainable agriculture crops that we participate in growing? And we can teach that to our children to make it part of the school curriculum, growing your own food, right? Uh, watch the Game Changers on Netflix, which is all about uh, plant-based diet, right? And thinking about then, so what do we do? Uh, let's sing. Uh, let's dance. Let's paint. Let's do art. Let us think outside the box now. And maybe some smart children will come up with the idea about how we're going to solve problems by thinking divergently about what faces us. Infuse our education system with hope, with the idea that it's all about their individual development and not punching a clock so that we are going to change our education system from the former September to June uh, culture, ag uh, agricultural calendar with, that we used when we were all farmers. So you got to get out of school in May and June so you can go work in the farm to get the crops going. Then you're back to school in September after harvest. Well, nobody does that anymore. So now you've got schools sitting empty for 10 weeks and people walking around. So why, not we, why don't we do uh, nine week semesters with three weeks in between spread out around the whole year, put more people to work in the education system and use the facilities that are sitting dormant and uh, costing money just by sitting there. Why don't we think outside the box? Uh, what are we going to do about all of these social, economic, and environmental issues that are facing us that we read about all the time and they're right there in front of us? They're right there with us. COVID is here. Global warming is here. Climate change is here. The change in the economic uh, currency system is here. And when you begin to read all these things, look at them from legitimate sources too. And I'm not just talking about social media, uh, uh, people shooting off their mouth about this. I'm talking about people who have been saying for a long time, people like Noam Chomsky, Gerald Salente, you know, that there are things going on right now that we should pay attention to because that is going to affect our quality of life and the quality of life of our children. So we have big problems and, and, you know, what do we do about all the debt the treaty debt? You know, well, one of the things I say, and it doesn't go over too well, it's a, um, uh, there's a place when the bank says uh, it's a non-recoverable debt. So we're going to forgive it. It's a non-recoverable debt. So we're not going to bother you anymore. We're writing it off. Maybe that's what we should do. Just write it off and say, uh, okay, the $20 trillion, uh, never mind, you keep it, but quit st stop trying to extinguish us. That's, a, that's the deal. Um, doc, Dr. Mike, I, uh, I, I don't want to interrupt or stop you, but unfortunately I must, because I feel like we may lose some, um, some of the guests. So it's 6.59 and this program, program ends at 7. Uh, I see some people writing um, <laughs> Michael Doxtater for Prime Minister. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> with that. Um, I, I don't know if you'll ha you have the time after we're closed here, but I'll leave, the, I'll leave it open a bit and maybe everyone can drop, uh, drop uh, Dr. Mike a, uh, a kind message because I think everyone really benefited from the information you had to share and it was really difficult for me as moderator to even decide when to ask another question because everything you were giving was just so much information that I think we've really been desiring. Um, mm -hmm. so, so thank you. 
Uh, and thank you, Jody and Sherry, for organizing uh, Dr. Mike being here. Uh, it is 7 o'clock, so uh, we, we certainly look forward to seeing you all next week. I hope that you had an opportunity to dig into some of the reading lists that we shared. And uh, I know you all have my email, so if you have any inquiries, please feel free to share. And I'll let Dr. Duxtater have the final word. Mm -hmm. I'm, so I'm sorry to make you drink out of the fire hose. And I hope we have some time where we can just have fun. Because yes. fun, you know, uh, that's the way, that's where it's at with me. Uh, we got I've been waking up, and so have you, every single day, trying to figure out how to be happy and have fun that day. So let's do that again. Mm -hmm. Thank you and for your kind attention. Yeah, it was, so, it was so wonderful to have you with us, and definitely we'll have to have you back on because everybody was leaning in, and so you know that the, you have a captive audience when people are leaning in in their, in their computer. So thanks so much. Uncle Mike, it was absolutely wonderful that you were able to stop by and, and be with us for, for an hour. I'll hang around after the room empties to talk with Sherry and Daniel and uh, wherever jo where did Jody go? Oh, she had to go. Uh, um, Dennis Windigo was on live at on Grandmother's Voice, so she had to go. Yeah. If okay. you're, so if you're still interested in continuing conversation or learning this evening, uh, Grandmother's Voice uh, has a YouTube channel and they do live broadcasts. So Jody has jumped off to speak with another guest. So you can check out YouTube, Grandmother's Voice. And uh, I believe she started at seven o'clock. So you can jump right over to the next platform. <laughs> I'll just give everyone a chance to uh, log out. I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>